Okay. Uh, the audience that it's written for is assumed to have uh, somewhat of an understanding of, of economics. So if there's just a couple things about capitalism that aren't discussed to the full, to full extent, it's because of the understanding that. So uh, the format of this presentation is I'm going to read this, and uh, it should be about 10, 15 minutes, somewhere around that, so I'm going for it, and then afterwards, we just have an open discussion. So that's, uh, that's what the whole, that's what conference is in Cuba, and that's the way I'd like to have this presentation. So uh, if, you know, let's discuss the actual topic, if there's anything about the presentation itself that would be better, I'd like you to do that. So. Without further ado, um, the transnational capitalist class. Since the 1970s, the world has been going through a socio-economic transformation known as globalization. The existence of this phenomenon is widely accepted. And global capitalism appears to be its driving force. The trend is seen not as the cause, but as the consequence of capitalist development. Modes of production have been fragmented and decentralized as capitalists have integrated the global systems specifically designed around the pursuit of maximum profit accumulation. This has resulted in the creation of the global ruling class, hereafter referred to as the transnational capitalist class, or we just call it TCC. Transnational refers to forces, processes, and institutions that cross borders, but you do not derive power directly from one state. Now, most critics of globalized capitalism portray it as an impersonal force which ordinary people and sometimes entire nations can do nothing to impact. As the economist William Robinson said, this is both empirically false and morally fatalistic. The system itself is dependent upon mass consent, and there are identifiable actors driving globalization. The TCC is made up of individually and interlocking groups, including transnational capitalist corporations and financial institutions, mass media conglomerates, powerful political and bureaucratic, professional and technical entities, supranational economic planning plan agencies. Supranational is made up of nations, so it's above nations, but it's made up of nations. So let's stop with this. Transnational corporations. Transnational corporations, TNCs, are at the forefront of global capitalist expansion. The other components of the TCC actively support these corporations, making them the central factor. Without a global economy dominated by powerful globalizing corporations, the TCC itself could not exist. The main characteristics of these TNCs is their ceaseless pursuit of maximum return on capital investment. Corporations are formally owned by millions of individual shareholders whose main interest is in seeing the value of their investments increase. And the sole purpose for business exists not within the confines of their respective industries, but with the realization of profit. Maximum return on investment is the lifeblood of capitalism, and the details of how profits are generated are inconsequential, even when the sustainability of the system itself is put into question. The effective control of these corporations is usually vested in small groups of owner executives and institutional shareholders, most of whom are members of the TCC. The personnel comprising these distinct groups are fairly interchangeable, with well-connected individuals moving from one position of power to the next. Interchangeable personnel shows how interconnected the global capitalist system is. Classes. A simple example can be found in the Bush administration. George Bush oil tycoon, the president of the most powerful capitalist country. Dick Cheney, vice president and former chairman and CEO of the global infrastructure company Halliburton. And Paul Wolfowitz, former U.S. Deputy Secretary of Defense and president of the World Bank. These relationships represent potential conflict of interest as well as show how can we connect with the TCC. Dear President, the TCC pops up politicians in capitalist countries via powerful lobby groups and generous campaign contributions given to candidates that promote the interests of the class. In this way, the class can legally bribe political leaders. It's commonplace to argue that in the age of capitalist organization in most countries, political party parties rarely make any significant differences because no political party that seriously challenges capitalist globalization stands much chance of being elected. For example, the United States political system is comprised of two ideologically opposing political parties. 
but both of them actively and overwhelmingly support global capitalism. Supranational bureaucratic organizations promote the use of global capitalism by providing access to large loans while guiding economic reforms for developing and struggling countries. Examples of such agencies include the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization, and the World Economic Forum. These agencies provide funding for nations in need, along with mandatory structural changes promoting neoliberal economic and trade reforms. They systematically promote the suppression of national protectionism and the creation of free trade zones, providing access to capital on the condition that borrowing nations open themselves up to capitalist growth. The media. Mainstream mass media conglomerates often by the way, effectively disseminate and spin information to increasingly misinformed audience. In this way, the globalizing ideology of the TCC is spread to the masses. These groups achieve significant success in getting across the message that there is no better alternative to social capitalism. Televised programs and printed press actively lead viewers to believe that pro-business policies are necessary and good for the nation supporting proponents of the TCC and globalizing that basis while dismissing criticism. The internet increasingly plays a significant role in spreading information to those with access. Google's do right mantra is rhetorically sound, but their ability to limit access to certain information and choose which sites appear to be web engine searches should definitely raise a few items. How the TCC operates. Members of the TCC are aware of their existence as a global class, as well as the fact that they are far better organized than the world. They do not act alone, but together with the interconnected channels web around the world. The control over the most significant economic resources <coughs> allows them to further their interests in ways not accessible to the vast majority of the world. Military interventions by means of nations that are loyal to the TCC have proven to be extremely useful and profitable to the global class. Interventions effectively extend market activities by opening up and, prote and protecting regional markets for the TNC generally crushing opposition forces in an effort to stabilize global economic activity. Prolonged occupations tend to be quite profitable for powerful industries, including firms specializing in armament, infrastructure, and key natural resources. However, such interventions generally occur only when coercive means are exhausted. The CCC generally prefers to operate through a culture of manipulation and intimidation that forces cooperation. Justification for an inherent problem of globalization. Globalization is not the cause or the consequence of capitalist development. It is necessary for contemporary capitalism because of the declining rate of profit a closed contained economic system generates. Mechanisms like expansion and intensified worker production can combat this decline, but restrictions like unions limit intensified production. In an effort to maximize profits, capitalists have responded by expanding globally. Free trade policies open the door to transnational capital in new ways, providing the capitalist class with the opportunity to extend the profit plans. The clear message coming out of most global capitalist firms is that global expansion became necessary for the survival of the company. An important part of economic globalization is how modes of production have become increasingly fragmented and decentralized. The global division of labor builds flexibility in the system. Capital can migrate, migrate worldwide in search of the cheapest source of labor, limiting the number of workforces that can decisively hold capital to ransom by good jobs. In this way, domestic wages for workers are suppressed in capitalist countries. The focus of workplace control is the threat that jobs will be lost, and in the extreme, the economy will collapse unless workers are prepared to work longer and for less in order to meet foreign competition. Maximum returns drive, drives the system, and the combination of lower wages and higher prices generates a larger surplus. This pursuit guarantees, at best, the persistence, and at worst, the intensification of class polarization on a global scale. So it becomes clear that the problem of social division is not based on policy, but is inherent within the system. National versus global. Globalization has a contradictory relationship concept of national interest. For the TCC, global goals supersede national interest. 
transnational corporations have no fundamental loyalty to any of the locations in which they do business. They aim to make money for the company and its shareholders, not the nations they were founded in. They actively work towards creating the political conditions for diverting state support for major corporations operating within state borders under the rhetorical rallying cry of national competitors. Although the conception of global national companies is deeply entrenched in popular thought and academic research, it is a fundamentally false assessment. Transnational corporations conduct much of their business outside the conference of national borders. To them, siding with a particular nation is a matter of strategic alliance. And when it becomes no longer necessary to support a nation in order to conduct business, ties are easily severed. National politicians are aware of this relationship but are unable to alter it, as their positions are protected only so far as they represent the capitalist class. This arrangement is creating a fission within the political system for high income countries, a contradiction that helps to explain why nation states have behaved and will continue to behave in unpredictable and inconsistent ways. Good. Impact on developing nations, such as Cuba. Developing nations feel the effects of global capitalism quite acutely. Many of these countries conceive of neoliberalism as the best system for crafting the nation into a globally competitive state, and they insert themselves into a global capital system under the guise of competitiveness. Although it is true that economic shocks are usually accompanied by a sharp increase in transnational presence, capitalist reforms are often courted by the powerful entities within developing countries that stand to profit from globalization. The main force is pushing capitalist support to third world countries and transnational corporations working in collaboration with state officials and the national working party. Although global companies often stifle the growth of smaller companies in developing nations, many large third world corporations are globalizing to a level that approximate with those of the first world. This undermines the assertion that globalization is strictly a Western imperialist movement. Global capitalist expansion has led to increased economic exploitation of laborers worldwide, but particularly in developing nations, where intensified repression has led to increased strife and instability. Leaders of cooperative nations receive substantial funds from the PCC, which often strengthens, strengthens the power of ruthless dictators worldwide. Reporting capitalism to third world countries is extremely profitable for the PCC. And the actual type of government ruling these new markets is only relevant when trying to ascertain how stable the markets will be over time. Capital maintains no allegiance, and all nations, developed or otherwise, should expect the TCC to act accordingly. Sustainability. There are growing concerns regarding the sustainability of global capitalism. TNCs are skilled at picking up on trends, and thus it is no surprise that concepts like going green are expressive primary goals, regardless of the overwhelming evidence indicating otherwise. Our environment is undergoing a period of potentially catastrophic change as capitalism actively promotes the blatant disregard of ecological sustainability, all in the name of business. Global capitalism survives by expanding and devouring all useful resources. This is an unsustainable strategy, and the fact that the TCC resorts to coercive tactics indicates their awareness of how potentially unpopular this arrangement would be if it's followed. It appears that we are hurtling towards a breaking point, and it seems unlikely any significant change will originate within the system itself. Opposition and conclusion. The current form of global economic exchange is not fair or sustainably viable to the system for the majority of human beings. It is dominated by a highly organized, resourceful, and monopolizing hierarchy that appears to be unstoppable. Yet, it is of utmost importance to recognize that we have the capability to effectively shape the path of the future. Resistance to global capitalism is only effective through local disruptions at the moment, since no current social movement appears to even remotely likely to overthrow any of the major institutions comprised of the PCC. Nevertheless, there is nothing inherently prohibiting local movements from becoming global. Globalization will ultimately free resistance movements from the current regional ones. The dialectics of global capitalist expansion, which has caused so much exploitation, oppression, and misery for the peoples of the world, 
has in turn created the conditions for its own destruction. Globalization has brought about both the globalized capitalist class and the global working class, setting the stage for a worldwide class struggle between capital and labor. This process will likely continue until either the dramatic class of the global system or the rise of a sufficiently unified and organized transnational working class. Workers of the world unite. Um, and I mean, you can just go down the list. 
There are agencies that actually carry out national policy. Media, for example, would be Al Jazeera. True, there is a universal agreement that capitalism and neoliberalism is a great approach, but it's not at all clear that that's due to any transnational capitalist class, but rather the thesis that every individual nation is itself competing to maintain a privileged position over the world economics. In this case, this would seem to be at the conference, I would say, in an uh, uh, opportunity to let more people speak. I would like to refer you to the article, where I can provide you a lot more detail. I would gladly answer a lot of these questions uh, afterwards. So please, let's start with Well, I just add, I agree with your thesis on that, but uh, it's not even a great deal. The WTO has made us all the G20 countries, which are the global trade countries make that for the richest people in those countries too, you know, as a part of the community of the WTO. So it's a, it's a correct piece that I see. Superseded like national capitalist classes. However, I do think that like it's more global than it ever has been. There's no constant like the, the level of globalization is incredible. I mean, the richest person in the world is Carlos Slim from Mexico. You know, I mean that that should say something just right there. But I, I still think the reason why I think it's important to, in, in my view, in my own opinion, uh, to see why national capital still is dominant is because, just like Rosa Luxemburg talks about in the former revolution, the globalization of capitalism is really just the inverse of its extreme nationalism, you know. And I think that you see the growth, and I, I, see, I think as we see more and more, there's actually kind of a growing protectionist trade war that's going on, especially between the U.S. and China, while at the same time, they have this symbiotic relationship, you know. And I think, in, in, in my opinion, I think that, uh, that, like, if you see some kind of shutdown, between all these different like sectors of the capitalist world, that's what triggered the first the, like the Great Depression. You know, that hasn't happened. I think there's been so much there's so much credit, there's so much uh, you know money just being pumped into the system. There's so many different things that are kind of keeping the system afloat um, that that hasn't happened. You know, and also not to mention the extremely cheap labor from you know societies that have never been as nearly as capitalist as they are now that can be uh, openly exploited by the superpowers. So I think all these things that are like factors into it. I do think it's really important, in my opinion, while I, while I don't know if I necessarily agree uh, that the, the transnational capitalist class has overtaken the national capitalist class, 
I think globalization is maybe the most important thing for Marxists and for socialists and for everyone, revolutionaries, to grapple with and try to figure out. Because it's really impacted us in a profound way. You, you write about it, about there is also a strife within the capitalist plan. Because not every capitalist uh, is, makes any money locally. You know, so there's a little bit of conflict between the ones that make their money just in the nation around the across the world. So there is that. But it seems to be that it, whether it's uh, uh, superseded the national capitalist class at this point or yet, it does see, appear that the trend is well, yeah, I was, I was questioning um, how would Cuba's government play into the um, CCC correlate to it? Well, they haven't really been integrated very much, and a lot of it has to do with the U.S. embargo. So right now, they're currently enacting reforms that are opening up more. And it does, it, you know, it's, it's uh, Theorized that once Fidel dies, and maybe one of the crowd dies, that it doesn't kind of don't want to do this. But it looks like that's the So the cube is kind of like on the radar, like right from the beginning part of the scene, Castro kind of checking out. Potential. But it, potential. And so they're trying to, they have a strong background in national protectionism. They're trying to decide what is the best way to move forward that takes care of the people, but also, you know, helps the country. From what I know, I haven't studied Cuba uh, specifically, so I can't give you all the details. Like I'd love to talk to you about Cuba before you go. I was there. Yeah. 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 Just not at all what I expected, based on what I had read. And I feel like my education is still some of as far as that point, but I don't know. I'd love to talk about it. Um, and this open up is happening right now. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, go ahead and start your own business. So, well, then they tax you for 50%, and, and they're making it and they're making it impossible to do, but they're still doing it. 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 It's scary. People are, who have started businesses since they opened, like six months ago they opened it up or something like that. They're not doing very well. It's not working at the moment. So. Um, just as far as your presentation goes, how I can do the argument with this paper, I'm not an economics major, but just looking at this, um, I think it would really help you to use the study that you have been in undeniable facts. Right, no, you're definitely right. And they expect that to be a longer paper, but as they, as they even wrote this, uh, this is not how much, how many points can they just have? Right. You know, I would say, like, if you could try and get it in, like, a little bit of you. Yeah. And even, I would even try and make your pieces clearer in the beginning. I didn't really have what you were trying to say until, like, this application. <laughs> no, no. So, yeah. Take that into consideration. Yeah, that word is. I think it's a good thing, and uh, one of the things that I really liked was the idea that the media present to the consumers that capitalism is the only option. Uh, yeah, that's something that, that's true that I never really thought about. But what I wanted to address is, um, so you're concerned with economic globalization and the, the transnational capitalism class. I wonder about the purported globalization of <coughs> civil and political rights, which followed the globalization according to the proponents of economic and social rights. Um, do, do, do these latter, more egalitarian globalization movements fit into what you mentioned in your conclusion, that uh, there is, in fact, the possibility for the masses to uh, uh, provide some kind of way to force the economic globalization? Uh, I think it's the only chance we have. Um, I, I'm not, I, don't, I can't afford to say I know the best system. I, I'm, not, I'm not making any such statements. Um, I think 
I'm not sure what is the best path forward. I'm just saying that it is possible. I think that it's that my personal feeling is something that's going to have to be socially, socially democratic and you know, that's going to take in a lot of these different causes. And they're ultimately pushing for, I think, the same thing for the most part, which is you know, a better way to operate the world. Um, but I can't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what way that is. I just think that, uh, that it's, it has to happen. It, it should happen. But so I think why we're all in this room right now as revolutionaries is we believe that we can make change. And we can we unite together at least provide a platform to you. Yeah, you talked about uh, sustainability. Would it be possible to uh, intensify global capitalization or capitalism to a point that would scare even TCC members? Probably. I don't know. Maybe. How much? How far will we, can we be pushed? I guess. Let's know. You know, I'll bite on something else. Um, you talked at two different points about uh, how modes of production have been fragmented and decentralized as part of this uh, global globalization movement. And I, I wonder if that's the case, you know, because you see that uh, the market trends are such that there's consolidation uh, in particular industries and across industries, you know, uh, vertical and horizontal integration. And then there's consolidation of media companies and, and this and that. And that sort of, in my mind, jives with the, uh, uh, well, it, the fragmentation don't seem to mesh with that. Can you flesh that out a bit more? I think what it means is uh, different things. It used to be, you know, you get, you have all of the feminists the industrial revolution in this country. Think about the industrial revolution. Have all the all the um, chains of production right next to each other. You know they were built in that way. It's, and nowadays they put them. They're all over the world. You know you can make one thing one place, send it to this place. You know or have something else made somewhere else. Set a, a place in a, in a third country where they put it together. You know sold it to a things like that. So that, I think that's why that's what I mean. um, I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they're, they're all controlled by one entity, right? Yeah, well, corporation, that, I mean, the most production underneath one, like one corporation is doing that. So the corporation might be, you're going to go to I'm pretty sure that they're going to be You mean these might be centralized? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, the, 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 the production itself for each by the corporation is centralized within that corporation. But the actual locations where the production is taking place. I think he had his hand up. I'm just going to say, I wonder uh, if you can kind of speak to the idea a little bit or if you thought about it as like with the abstraction of capital. Like it basically, you know, it's not not even on the silver standard, but it's like moved into something that's entirely theoretical. That that then makes the point of like more globalization of like this capitalist movement, as opposed to just nationalist capital, when people were just holding, you know, the countries were just holding their gold in their Fort Knoxes or whatnot. And I mean, not to say that we don't have those, but just that it doesn't represent the percentage of the capital of the country that it does now. I mean, you know, like you were saying, with the modes of production and whatnot, everything was, in a sense, it was all easy to nationalize because it would all be right there. Whereas now it can be anywhere, but no matter where you like make your Nike shoes, the Nike dollar, like the biggest portion of their dollars will end up in like Manhattan. You know what I mean? Like, um, I don't know. What was the actual question? Yeah, I didn't get it. <laughs> Basically, well, what? it's amusing on the idea of as capital has become more theoretical, does that then, is that working toward the idea, like, is that helping aid the fact that it's becoming more global? 
as opposed to just like okay. seriously like national interest alone. What's that? What's that? Right. Can I ask a qualifying question? When you say capital is becoming more abstract, do you mean that the currency and the monetary policy is not based on a form of species? It's not based on gold or silver? Uh, the capital, yeah, is the, yeah, is, is, is it's something that's not a, an object. It's a, it's a, a theoretical yeah. concept of the global commodity. Well, then what I would actually say is, um, what, what has happened is capital has become more sophisticated. The reason why it's become more sophisticated is if you base your currency, your monetary policy, on something that's concrete, yeah. one of two things happen. Either you run out of that concrete thing, yeah. and so you have massive deflation, like say I have only 100 gold bars, I used to only make 100 products, and now I make 1,000 products, suddenly there's not enough money to go around, or I start shaving pieces off of that gold. Yeah. Right? And so essentially now I would have 1,000 gold correspond to 1,000 production. Well, the transition is not from uh, gold to abstract. It's a transition from gold to production. Currency isn't abstract. It's not based on nothing or fiat currency. You hear this all the time, our money isn't based on anything. That's not accurate. Instead, it's a much more sophisticated system where it's based on production. So it does make it a little more difficult to cause crises in capitalism because the crises of capitalism previously were often linked to a lack of um, monetary funds, yeah. either for investment or for buying or for selling. Now it's a little more difficult because it's linked to production, so it's easier for central banks like the Federal Reserve, like the European Union banks, like uh, you know the Japanese banks, to monetary or to control monetary policy, either increase the amount of funds or decrease the amount of funds, so it fits to the uh, the you know the actual amount of production that's going. Yeah, and so it's. But it's, I mean, then you still have derivatives on top of that. So, I mean, it, in a sense, it becomes a step removed from like just. Uh, uh, it's not like a production equals this amount of currency because then you have a derivative, so it's like a squared of. Kind of. I mean, that's what I start to wonder if anything else beyond. Not really on subject, though, is it? What do you mean? You know what I mean? Money's money. <laughs> Fuck it. You know? <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't mean to. I don't mean to interrupt, but that's a different topic, don't you think? And what it, Mike's it talking seem, about. It's a, it's a philosophical question that yeah. ultimately goes back down to what is what is value based on, you know? Yeah. So I mean then you just now you know, you're just talking you is it based on labor? Well no, but I mean you know, it, it is a good question, but well, yeah, but we're having a discussion about like the theoretical concept of it and I I, I don't know, I was interested in what it's going to add and what what's the what's the point of that it's really bad. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't necessarily entirely agree with that. I do think that there is quite a bit of fictitious capital in the system. Precisely, for in fact, the financialization of the economy points to that. I think there's like ten times the amount of money as productive uh, as was wor is warranted by the productive forces that exist. So it seems to me like that's a harbinger of doom. You know, I mean, the reality is that this is a, it has to be based on something, or it's eventually going to collapse. In a lot of ways, what happened in 2008 was precisely all this financialization collapsing in on itself. The only way that they were able to stop the whole thing from collapsing under this big mound of sand was by pushing so much sand under it, you know, that when it falls, it's going to just utterly, you know, crumble. So I think, in, in my view, and maybe it's slightly different from Greg's, I do think that I do agree with quite a bit of what Greg is saying. I think there's quite a bit of financialization which is kind of like, it, it's crazy. It's making money out of nothing. You're literally making your your job is to invent pieces of paper, you know. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I do actually think, in my view, uh, is the fact that they can't use gold, they can't use some of these old standards uh, anymore, precisely shows you know, the the depths of capitalism is willing to go in order to make a, a quick profit to destroy their long term stability. And the reality is that they really don't have any other choice because of the declining rate of profit. They absolutely have to. So, or the, I should say, the, the general tendency for the decline in the rate of profit. I think there's two things to say about this, and you know, maybe that this is an overly classical Marxist approach, but I think Marx put it together pretty well in Dallas Capital when he said, when you hold a piece of coin in your hand, you're holding a literally solidified piece of labor. And it's really important that, you know, that's the truth, that's, it, that's the fetish. Right? But it's important that we don't mystify ourselves into other fetishes 
which causes speculation problems in the market. Because when you do speculate on the market, what you're doing is you're really buying future labor and what that might be worth in the future. So we should not uh, we should not be very confused as to whether or not the species, you know, again covered in I, I believe it's in wage labor and capital very clearly as well, right? It's C to M to C, right? The money is merely just the house of that, and gold was merely just the house See, of that. Commodity and then right. money. Right. Yeah, com commodity, money, commodity, right? And right. you know, we have the previous forms. So there's that. Tying that back to the conversation, um, when we're looking at both an imperialistic model or this sort of national capitalist class, uh, or excuse me, international capitalist class, uh, it's compatible with both of them. So for instance, if India is producing a whole bunch of labor for us, that's fine, but you know, it doesn't matter whether or not the people working in your factory live in India or whether or not they live in the town next over. Um, ultimately, what's going to produce that wealth is going to be the fact that you are able to turn that labor into a commodity. So, you know, it's compatible obviously both with the imperialistic model and the one that you're suggesting. Um, so those are my two comments there. As an additional measure, uh, just to kind of front the idea that imperialism is at least the most dominant form, I think it's covered in Lenin's um, oh geez, uh, imperialism in the highest state of capitalism. Uh, it doesn't matter the fact that other countries or even small individuals or even laborers own shares in a union or a company, or excuse me, uh, own it in a company or stocks in a company. The point is, is who has the controlling share? Um, who was it that said, uh, I forget, I think it was even somebody in this room that said, one of the interesting things they tried is they bought stock in a company and then tried to show up at a stockholders meeting to help make decisions. <laughs> yeah, you know what happened to that? They got kicked out, right? It, it's worth pointing out, just because you know other companies are integrated in the market to merely just sustain themselves in a capitalistic model, whether it be global or imperialist, doesn't mean that they have the controlling share or the controlling interest. Right. There's also another point to be made as well, which is uh, just because it's in a company's natural national interest to be um, to be capitalist, doesn't mean that it's protecting the nation itself, right? Which I hope is not the claim that you're making. No, no. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I think you're wrong. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I think like nationalism is just a weird way. It's kind of like in the past. It's still like it's still used. makes America powerful now then, or what made it powerful 70 years ago, was it the actual nation itself, or was it the same exact situation you're describing now, Global which is? Globalization basically changed the sentence, um, and that's pretty much a well documented like, like The current form of contemporary globalization change. Obviously, you know, I mean, look at the Silk Road, right? All the things that they did, yeah, they integrated across, the, you know, at least large geographical locations. For the dawn of history, really, and for writing, and things like that. So I'm not saying that things that this is the first time uh, that there is global exchange, but uh, it has changed since the 70s like the way that uh, capitalism has been branched. And, I'm, and though some years ago it seems to me, and this is just what I, my take on it is, that America became strong because we were we, we were so rich. You know, we were a capitalist country, we had money, you know, it was about the nation. But now, they, 
information data exchange. You know, and with that, we can be working within that closed contained environment. And that's when we don't work your rights. That's when we start saying, you know what? You can't just push us. We will have strikes and we will get our rights. And we did so. And, you know, they, were, they weren't making as much money. They had to play by our rules to some extent, as much as our rules. Um, globalization allowed them to skip those. You know, they're like, really? You know, you're going to strike? We're going to strike. You know, sorry. You know, and that's, that's just the way it's kind of going. But wouldn't you say there's a substantial difference between the idea of building a factory in China and going to China? Because the, the money hasn't really gone to China. The money stays here. I don't think it stays here. They're putting the blood in China. It's That's where the they put the product. stays within the people who own the corporations. We think China has the money. We have the debt. Yeah. That's the <laughs> thing. Yeah. It's the other way around. Like, uh, you know, I, I think America is still a wealthy country, despite the debt concept, you know? Well, you know, we still, I think we're still strong, but yeah. I think that the corporations are the ones who are making the whole money. Look how we saw another deficit last year. You know, we're losing, the country itself is losing money. And in corporate profits last year, were better than ever. You said it really well in your argument that one of the biggest you know, profits that they can be throughout the world. You know, those are when Israel bombed Lebanon a couple years ago, they dropped all those bombs, those illegal cluster bombs on the border of the Lebanon. They was all said. That's one of the things that's said. Is it possible that globalization is just Yeah, I was just going to say as an idea how globalization is providing the, you know, the, I guess the grave diggers of its own system is, I mean, well, first off, there's the Middle Eastern Revolution, which it wasn't just one country, it's throughout. And I mean, while obviously the Facebook thing's been played up way more than it deserved to be, it certainly was something. I mean, the, the reality is that we have, you know, Karl Marx talks about how means of communication improving are one of the main reasons why the working class can be an international class. You know, and I think that there's never been a time we've had more international communication than we have now. Uh, I think now, we, as far as, I don't, I don't know if I know if I agree with the decentralization aspect, but I definitely agree with the fragmentation aspect of what you're talking about, because the reality is, they really, they've taken everything, they've broken them up into different countries. But, and this is, a, this is a bad thing, since they can use it as a blunt instrument against the working class, I guess, to break up unions, which is what they did, although it does actually hurt their long-term profitability. But the thing is that what they, what this also provides is the ability for international unions. I mean, the, the reality is there was a time where there's no, like, you know, IWW, they were 100 years too soon. Because the reality is there's really no possibility of international unions in 1902, you know? The, like in 2011, it's almost impossible to not have them. You can't, you, it's almost like we can't even win without international unions. You know? So we, need, we and that's one thing that we should be in the unions pushing for is creating international uh, alliances with other unions trying to form in the bigger, you know, wider international with, with internationalist policies. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I guess that these are all things that the working class has never been larger, despite we maybe you've heard that working class has disappeared. 
The reality is that production workers uh, have grown by leaps and bounds, just not in the United States, you know. And so, I mean, all these things really, they're all pointing to the, the end of Rome, you know. Okay, so, yeah, let's just stipulate that you're correct about uh, there being a global capitalist class. What does the decline of the United States under a system of materialism look like, and how is that different from the decline under the thesis that you're suggesting? I'm saying that imperialism is proceeding just, it's just proceeding rampantly. I'm just saying it's not American imperialism. It's a way it's like global capitalist imperialism. It's an ideological imperialism, more so than it's just national imperialism. America is still one of, if not the richest capitalist class. So we will, I mean, flat capitalist country. So we will see the agendas of that capitalist class expressed through our, through our nation. But uh, I do believe that it is ultimately going to, once they recognize that America is no longer is, that they can't, I mean, America is a tool, basically. Yeah, this nation is a tool for this class, as I see it. And, we, and they use it, and they pay for it, and they, they write these hefty checks out just so they make sure that they can use it. It's like having a lawyer, a good lawyer. You know, they pay for the lawyer, the lawyer keeps them out of trouble, or, you know, they can do whatever they want, the lawyer gets them out of trouble. You know, it does kind of make it good. And I just think, um, I mean, that, is that, I don't know, uh, I think that imperialism, though, is still making it. It's not good enough. Yeah, I mean, it would seem to me, then, that instead of uh, the sort of imperialistic models where, for instance, we can even sound intelligible by saying something like, oh, well, the Philippines is the new sweatshop of the world, that things like that would no longer even be intelligible to say. But it seems to me like that's almost still very much the case. Well, they're still, we're, still, we're still arranging around nations. Right. But here, here's the thing is, if there's a global imperialist class, it seems to me like there would be a sort of unifying method by which one class would be dominating another class, but then that would supersede all national lines. So if that were more so the case, then we would be talking about sort of like internal oppressed nationalities, like for instance, we talked about how, you know, the capitalists are exploiting the Kurds or something like that. The thing is, it doesn't seem to me like we're talking about it like that yet. And like, we're still talking about on a very national level, and I think I, I mean, like, I hate to just drive this home again, but it seems to me like imperialism is still the dominant mode. I mean, there might even be arguments for this being emerging as something that's in a tendency, but I don't think merely because the United States is in power uh, from a sort of global stance that it's just not going to be a new imperialistic power from an imperialistic standpoint. I mean, the gentleman over here said it made it quite clearly, right? Who is it that owns all the money? Is it China or the United States? That's not a question that would appear if yours was mainly at hand, you know. And uh, you know, it's worth it's worth also pointing out when Marx first started writing about capitalism, he wasn't writing about it necessarily from a nationalistic perspective of imperialism. That was Lenin that brought that, and you'll notice that it wouldn't have made sense to talk about that as much from a Marxian standpoint when he wrote that. But it did when Lenin was, and his, of course, speculation is that it was the, the last stage of capitalism. So no, I, I think you're right, and I, I, once again, we're on. I think I think Greg and think of everybody else can make clear that if I said I, I said something about how it has superseded national agenda, I, I think it's, I'm thinking in more in terms of trends. I think it's heading that way. I think right now, though, there's still definitely uh, spheres of influence being carved all over the world. Imperialism nationally also still doesn't exist. I just think that uh, that the ideological idea of capitalism itself is, is quickly becoming, if not, if it hasn't succeeded, uh, succeeded it is on its way to becoming the most dominant imperialist movement in the world. Absolutely. But it, yes, it's still not the same. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I think this very much goes back to a question that was at the heart of the discussion 
um, about 100 years ago. If you keep in mind, 100 years ago, you had had more or less peace in Europe because of the concert of Europe from about 1814, which went until about 1914, in which case the imperialists unleashed the most bloody war in the history of the world. And there were two theses. There was the thesis of imperialism, which was, no, it was still concrete nation states that were engaging in violence and oppression and investment. And if there was any peace between them, it was just a covering over of those distant, uh, differences that would later, under the very pressure of these national interests, explode into the floor, which concretely they did through World War I. The secondary thesis was, uh, and that was Lenin, the secondary thesis was posed by Trotsky, which is actually very similar to the thesis being pushed here, which is no, what was going to emerge would be uh, ultra-imperialism, which is above imperialism, which is to say an elite capitalist class, irrespective of nations, then dominating the working class of the entire world. And the reason why he said this is, look, we've had peace for this long, and there's capitalist consolidation, and there's consolidation across all lines. Now, I mean, there's a strong reason to believe in this consolidation, or this trend of consolidation, going from 1991, the fall of the Soviet Union, to about 2001. But in 2001, I think we see a clear break in which this trend, much like the trend of consolidation of the last century, breaks down which is you have the United States as a nation state acting unilaterally against the world governing bodies. You have the exclusion based on national interests, i.e. France and Germany were exploded, uh, or exploded, sorry, excluded um, from the exploitation of Iraq. And even more so, I mean, if, if the transnational class is to be taken, then what is to be said of, say, Russia and South Ossetia, or Russia and Ukraine? Is that a different transnational class? And if it is, what gives it the constitution that's hostile to the other emerging transnational class? Yeah, I just wanted to posit maybe, like I, I understand, and I, and I do agree with a lot of the rest of what you're saying, but maybe posit the idea that instead of saying like a transnational capitalist class, more like a transnational, transnational capitalist system, you know, I mean globalization. Like I really think it's, these are all constituent parts of, they're all, they all have their own independent national interests. Um, I think that if you saw like one World Bank, I mean I know there's a World Bank, but it's not one World Bank. If you have one World Bank that really represents one currency, that really represents, you know, if you, if you have, uh, you know, I don't know, it, it's like these are not the, well it seems like that, I'm not saying it's not possible at some point, all kinds of bizarre transformations have happened, but I would say, in many ways, one of the problems in my view with capitalism is not that it's too monolithic, it's that it's, it is too decentralized, it exists, it, there's no plan, there's no ability to, to actually... You know, central to regulate yeah, you can't regulate things, and you, even when they have regulation, I think Bonner doesn't have regulation, I couldn't really quite hear it, but as far as regulation goes, you can't regulate what you don't own. And the reality is, I mean, you can re you, they actually can to an extent, but when it comes down to it, you know, the reality is that these governments are all just how come the people actually own these things. So that's why the regulations isn't be generally being no post or non-existent. So, but I don't know. So I guess that's my idea. Is maybe it, viewing viewing it more as globalization as a system, and, and because I think down the line we're already seeing. Greg's talking about some of these conflicts that have already emerged. I think we're going to see much more. We're going to see much deadlier conflicts that emerge, and, and we won't be able to understand it unless we understand that they're very they're buying capitalists. National capital interests. So. I think another thing that back of your point too is that I guess it's what called the investment of the economic dynamics. But yeah, we're just seeing everyone and think that all around the world. But a lot of these uh, companies are given out loans and specifically go to like third world countries and have their exports there. So that just kind of shows that and they do that because tax rates and stuff like that. So we're going to have a national interest for the world war and stuff like that. We're just going to go to the right place. Yeah, two things I wanted to mention. Maybe one that strengthens your thesis, and then maybe one that detracts from it a little bit. Uh, the first is that, you know, obviously as a materialist, 
I would want to see some sort of emerging evidence of this. I think there is actually maybe one or two little things. Uh, recently, there was a pact between Brazil, India, and China saying that they would no longer uh, use U.S. dollars to trade between the com their countries and that they would use their own currency. Like, uh, in a certain way, what this does is it makes it so that the banks in the United States don't necessarily have uh, potentially controlling interests in those countries. If that's the case, that creates a little breathing space for those countries to develop their own national powers that are different, although still competing with the United States. So that's potentially uh, a supporting point. I don't think that arguments about the World Bank or the IMF, I think Greg's point's taken very well uh, on that side. But I do think there might be some different evidences um, but on the flip side of that same argument, what makes it so compelling in the imperialistic model is that it's all banks, and with money, regardless if it's traded in quail feathers or in dollars or in gold cubes or whatever, is that you can purchase it anywhere across the world. And to ignore the notion of monopoly and the practices of things like outlined in shock doctrine or other accidents, would to kind of ignore the weakness of these older countries or these weaker countries and the ability of other countries to merely just move in financially and dominate those people in monopoly. And, you know, I'm not sure what type of argument would have to be made in order to argue against the monopolistic nature of capitalism, but you would need to do something along the lines of that. Uh, the other is a more radical thesis I just came up with in my head, which is the actual anti-imperialism and global domination via imperialism or the competition of that is actually a fascistic national trend. Which is to say, the only way you can really make it so the United States or another dominant country has the ability to do that is if you install a strong national pride and you refuse to do business with them. And then now what are we looking at? Capitalism can still operate in a country like that. It doesn't even need to necessarily be capitalism. But in order to resist domination of imperialism, you're going to have to express a lot of isolationism and a refusal of international capital, which you know can lead both ways. I mean, in some ways that might look like, you know, Germany or something like that in the Third Reich. It could also look like Cuba. Cuba also refuses to be like it does have to do business with the rest of the world. It isn't. I mean, in a certain way, it's nationalistic, but obviously in a very different social sense. But also, you may want to be careful about what you say about Cuba in Cuba.